Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome back after lunch. Uh, if you would take your seats, because we're, um, we have a very busy afternoon ahead of us. So uh, once you're seated, if you want to t turn your phones off or to silent, that would be great. Um, our afternoon session begins with our final keynote of the conference, uh, and it will be delivered by Dr. Leanne Lane of Dublin City University. And the chair for this session is Dr. Mary McAuliffe of University College Dublin. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the final afternoon session of the conference and I can say so far um, the papers have been excellent and the discussion has been great and uh, I for one have really enjoyed it. Um, just sitting listening to all of these experts has been just a privilege. Uh, it is my privilege now to introduce um, a colleague and good friend, um, Dr. Leanne Lane, who is a lecturer in history in the School of History and Geography at DCU Dublin City University. She's the author of Rosamund Jacob, Third Person Singular from UCD Press in 2010, and a biography of, of the subject of this discussion, Dorothy McArdle, uh, UCD Press in 2019. And she's currently working on a biography of Mary McSweeney, whom, of course, Paddy O'Daly referenced that all the mad women in Coming Amon and Tralee were disciples of Mary McSweeney. But I think Leanne's uh, eagerly awaited forthcoming biography of Mary McSweeney will certainly give us a more nuanced and complicated view of Max Sweeney and her politics. In 2012, um, Dr. Lane was appointed by the Taoiseach to the Expert Advisory Committee, or Group on the Decade of Centenaries. She's going to talk to us today um, about Constructing the Civil War, the famous book by Dorothy McArdle, Her Tragedies of Kerry. Please welcome Dr. Leanne Lane. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Owen and Bridget, and thank you, everybody, for turning up. Uh, I know I'm clashing with the uh, Robbie Match, a uh, student of mine, sent me an email uh, to say she would be in Tralee, but, and then there were three uh, Robbie emoji balls, so uh, uh, I think <laughs> she has her priorities correct. Uh, so, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Tragedies of Kerry, and Tragedies of Kerry was uh, published a year uh, after uh, Dorothy McArdle was released from the North Dublin Union uh, in um, early May 1923. So the publication issued in 1924 was the first uh, such, was the first publication on the Civil War in County Kerry. Uh, an advertisement in the newspaper Sinn Féin on the 2nd of August 1924, described the volume as, quote, a brief record of men of the Kerry Brigade's IRA killed on the roadsides of Kerry in 1922 and 1923 with the full story of the fight at the Clash Malkin Caves. The newspaper Sinn Féin further noted that it was an illustrated volume and I want to spend some time discussing McArdle's intent in using the photographs that she did. It is noteworthy when you look at those photographs that uh, there's no actual photographs of the dead Republicans. Uh, there are certainly some photographs of crosses to the dead Republicans, but uh, the photographs of people are photographs of the families, particularly mothers of the dead Republicans, and that's something that I want to focus on, as I say. The publication was well received in many of the local Kerry uh, papers. Um, indeed, the editor of the Kerry Reporter offered it as a prize in this very curious entry on the 30th of August 1924. If we had a baby show at Farron 4, the little one up near the field of the old cow would win one of the best prizes. I will give a copy of the tragedies of Kerry to the first person who sends me a postcard with the baby's name on it. Now, I don't have very good agricultural knowledge, but I think that might be a prize for a calf, not an actual baby, but I might be wrong. Um, an advertisement for Emerton Press, the press that published the book, um, in, again, the newspaper Sinn Féin on the 16th of August, listed McArdle's publication, listed Tragedies of Kerry with, for example, My Fight for Freedom by Dan Breen. At this point, August 1924, the first edition of Tragedies was sold out, so it became a bestseller, uh, and um, the advertisement indicated that a second volume was imminent. By the 6th of December, uh, the, uh, the book was, quote, approaching its third edition. On the 16th of August 1924, McArdle wrote to Frank Aiken that the book was, quote, selling beyond any expectations. He in turn wrote to her, voicing criticism, that the book did not, quote, deal with all the tragedies, 
and suggested that the next edition would expand on the brutality of the Irish Free State against Republicans in the county. But Dorothy McArdle was not cowed by any man in this period, um, maybe quite uniquely uh, um, for women, um, and uh, she in turn uh, retorted to him that she, quote, deliberately confined it to roadside murders of unarmed prisoners, end quote. Tragedies of Kerry, of course, as the emotive title signalled, was a work of propaganda. And indeed, the Dundalk Democrat, um, Dorothy was born in Dundalk, um, uh, the Dundalk Democrat, uh, on its publication, was very anxious to make clear that it was uh, a work of propaganda. For McArdle, the propagandist, for, uh, for the propagandist McArdle, the killing of unarmed men had greater propaganda value than the murder of Republicans killed while engaged in active duty, and it's probably that's why she uh, put the focus on, uh, as she put it, roadside murders of unarmed prisoners. Uh, the work also contained descriptions of brutality towards women within the wider context of official ferocity against Republicans. Indeed, what was radical for a 1924 publication is that so much of the brutality and so many of the stories of murder, McArdle recounts, is from the point of view of the women who witnessed it, often family members and often mothers. Uh, in her article on killing in the Irish War of Independence, the historian Anne Dolan states that, quote, the soldiers' voices have long been the obvious ones. And Dolan makes the case instead for what she describes as wider tales of trauma and victimhood. For, and I'm quoting Dolan, for the witnesses who saw and stood by, for those who watched, for those who identified corpses, who went from wives to widows in the space of a few words before a coroner or a military court, for those who witnessed Ireland's kind of war, but not as soldiers or combatants or victims or participants in the sense that the history of killing has become accustomed to. And in many respects, this was the focus of tragedies of Kerry in the context of the Civil War. McArdle is interested in those who uh, dealt with the trauma of the loss of family members, etc. Uh, Ballyseedy uh, <coughs> was, sorry, after Ballyseedy, there was, McArdle writes, quote, a frenzy. The women seemed demented, end quote. Throughout the text, she detailed the desecration of the domestic sphere of the home by Irish Free State soldiers and the impact of the civil war on women as mothers, sisters and aunts. Uh, and this morning we heard, of course, Mary talking about uh, the brutality of the home in the context, the brutality of the desecration of the home in the context of uh, competent women. Uh, McCardle is interested in uh, the way in which women uh, uh, as wives, mothers and sisters uh, uh, suffered um, br the brutality of uh, the Free State, uh, what she would have seen occupation of uh, Kerry during the Civil War. Uh, <coughs> she stated that uh, when the British troops departed in 1922, they, quote, left in their place an army of Irish men pledged to the same king, end quote. And then she continued, June came and that army was commanded to complete the empire's unfinished work. Again, mothers saw their sons go out to the mountains and again they held in their hearts the dreadful knowledge. Without falling, they will not win. Released from the North Dublin Union in early May 1923, after six months in various civil war prisons in the capital, she had been first of all in Mount Joy, she had been captured, arrested on the 9th of November 1922, then she was sent to uh, Kilmainham in early uh, February 1923 and she spent a brief period of time in the North Dublin Union and she was released from the North Dublin Union in early May 1923 and at that point she had lost her position uh, as a, a teacher in Alexandra College and uh, she did face the same bleakness as many uh, Republicans who lost their position as a result of uh, involvement in the Civil War, but she uh, made a conscious decision that she intended to harness her intellect for the service of the Republic. Dorothy was not in any way shy about her sense of herself as having a great intellect, and she intended to harness it uh, to serve the Republic that she had gone to jail uh, to uh, defend uh, or to show her allegiance to. Uh, McArdle was initially employed by Sinn Féin, as a researcher at a salary of two pounds, 10 shillings a week. And this facilitated her to do the field work uh, 
uh, to uh, compile tragedies of Kerry. So she spent the spring of 1924 gathering testimonies and eyewitness accounts in Kerry. So she actually went to Kerry. This field work, following on from her six months imprisonment, was very far removed from her privileged background. Alexandra College uh, educated. Um, she went to university. Uh, she was, of course, the daughter of the upper middle class Thomas Callan McCardle, owner of McCardle Moore Brewery in Dundalk. Uh, her father was a home ruler. Her mother uh, was very much a supporter of the empire. And staying in Kerry in uh, spring of 1924 and going round the county as she did, uh, she, uh, Tragedies of Kerry is constructed along kind of geographical lines, so staying in Kerry in the spring of 1924 meant residing in what Gemma Clark describes as one of, quote, the famously hardline counties that experienced anomalously high levels of violence during the Irish Revolution. In discussing the dearth of crosses to the Free State dead in Kerry, and Dolan descriptively refers to the county as having, quote, run too red with Republican blood. The high levels of dis dislocation, damage and violence in the county are attested to in the compensation claims. There are about 1,200 such claims by individuals and businesses who experience this loss in the National Archives. If McArdle complained to Frank Gallagher of the cold and from her slightly haughty perspective of the less than hospitable conditions in the Metropole Hotel Waterford when she campaigned and postered for Michael O'Ryan, Fianna Fáil candidate, in the first June 1927 election, what she experienced in Kerry in the spring of 1924 must have been all the worse. In Tragedies of Kerry, she wrote how, quote, a traveller goes from Killarney to West Kerry and to North and Southwest Kerry as a bird flying out of a nest into windy skies, end quote. McCardle made a point of emphasising the economic toll on families um, in Kerry, uh, the economic toll of the Civil War uh, on families in Kerry, uh, with a particular focus on mothers. She wrote to Joseph McGarrity, a leading member of Clown Nigel in America, of the hardship she witnessed while engaged in research for tragedies, and she hoped that McGarrity could persuade Irish Americans to offer some uh, financial help. Humphrey Murphy, similarly described in a letter to Florence O'Donoghue on the 16th of June, 1923, the poverty experienced by the dependents of prisoners in Tralee. They were, he wrote, quote, in a very bad way. Of course, what McCardle neglected to say in Tragedies of Kerry uh, and in uh, the letter to McGarrity uh, was that uh, that poverty in Kerry and the deprivation in Kerry was worsened during the Civil War um, by Republican tactics, uh, such as, for example, uh, their attempts, often successful, uh, to disrupt uh, food supply networks and chains. Tragedies of Kerry became, as Owen O'Shea writes, quote, uh, quote a totemic reference point for the Republican narrative of the war in the county. Despite McArdle's protestations to objectivity, she created a clear distinction between villains and heroes in the work, revealing her Republican uh, leanings throughout. The noble Republican uh, fighter soldier was the foil to the free state soldier who acted as the proxy uh, of the officials and politicians of the treacherous, duplicitous British Empire, in her viewpoint. In his Bureau of Military History Witness Statement, uh, Brigade Engineer Seamus Bag Babington, 3rd Tipperary Brigade, uh, uh, described the free state soldiers during uh, the Civil War as the, quote, green and tans, and directed the reader to tragedies of Kerry for an illumination of the term. Ethna Coyle made a, a direct link between the violence women prisoners suffered on the removal uh, from Kilmainham to the North Dublin Union at the end of uh, April, early May 1923, uh, and the violence described in Tragedies of Kerry. So it becomes a touchstone very quickly uh, to uh, illuminate uh, the brutality of uh, the free state, and, and indeed not just in Kerry, but uh, elsewhere. <coughs> Coyle wrote in her memoir, uh, of the prisoners uh, being transferred from the Kilmainham to the North Dublin Union. Practically all the prisoners bore the scars of cruel, uncontrolled violence inflicted on, uh, on them by those who were supposed to keep law and order in the country. And let's not forget what our men suffered too. 
one has only to read the tragedies of Kerry. McArdle emphasised the core theme of unresolved history in tragedies of Kerry with an extract from a poem uh, uh, by the bardic poet to the O'Neill family in the north of Ireland, Far Flaha O'Ganeve, whose writing was centrally informed by the conquest and plantations of the early 17th century. If thou has consented, O God, that there be a New England named Ireland to be ever in the grip of a foe, then to this isle we must bid farewell. Republicans in Kerry were not, however, like the wild geese, according to McArdle, they remained and fought the British and their allies, the Irish Free State. They went into the hills of Kerry uh, and they fought from uh, those hills uh, and they continued to fight. Uh, they were, in her construction, selfless, idealistic and young men. Publications such as Tragedies of Kerry were considered um, from the beginning inflammatory by the government, a testimony to McArdle's success. She wrote how when she met Ty Coffey in March 1924, uh, his health was so bad that she brought him to Dublin and with the aid of Countess Markovich put him under the care of a doctor. Coffey of course was, uh, as everybody knows, the only survivor of the Countess Bridge ambush on the 7th of March 1923. The other four men were shot dead after the mine exploded. Coffey testified that when brought to Dublin by McArdle, it was too dangerous for him to go into hospital. While receiving medical treatment in Markovich's home in Ratgar, the Free State conducted a raid in a bid to seize uh, copies of Tragedy of Kerry. It was then a text on the raider of the Irish Free State from uh, its publication. Car uh, McArdle's <coughs> methodologies in Tragedies of Kerry as later in the Irish Republic, published in 1937, indicates her attempt to give her work the appearance of objectivity based on documentary evidence. She stated in the foreword that it is, quote, those clear, indisputable facts only that are set down here without art or artifice as they were told, end quote. However, the text arguably contained lesions and omissions and in places was highly fictionalized. In Tragedies of Kerry, the massacre of Republicans during the terror month of March 1923 at Ballycedy, Countess Bridge Killarney and at Carsevine or near Carsevine, uh, those massacres were described in some detail. Now it was a very short text, um, it was only uh, just over 80 uh, pages long, uh, but uh, she devotes some time to describing those massacres at Ballycedy, Countess Bridge and near Carsevine. Uh, the uh, massacre at Car Savine was attributed to the work of a murder gang amongst the Dublin Guard who wanted, according to McArdle, to keep the war going. In the Irish Republic, McArdle declared, undoubtedly, the less disciplined elements of the Free State Army were in control in Kerry. However, the anti-treaty attack on Knock which precipitated the reprisals and the decision by Paddy O'Daly uh, et al. to use Republican prisoners to clear landmines, the pretext for summary executions, was represented in tragedies of Kerry as the actions of desperate men, as the legitimate actions of desperate men who sought to put a stop to the pernicious behaviour of Lieutenant O'Connor of the National Army. O'Connor, according to McArdle, quote, had made a hobby of torturing Republican prisoners in Castle Island. In her account in Tragedies of Kerry, the deaths at Nagashal are arguably glossed over in a short paragraph. There is no discussion of the fact that, as Ono Shea discusses, the animosity of Paddy Pats O'Connor towards the IRA was partly personal and emanated uh, in part from the plunder of the home of his elderly parents by the IRA and the kidnap and torture of his father. McArdle evocatively described, quote, the birds eating the flesh of the trees at Ballycedy Cross, end quote. Referring to the massacre near Car Savine on the 12th of March, she emotively described two nurses picking up, quote, a chain of rosary beads soaked in blood, end quote. She wrote how the owner of the field in which the Car Savine killings occurred could no longer graze his horses in it, because, quote, they went mad with the smell of blood, end quote. McArdle, of course, had a BA in English literature. 
uh, before she was arrested, she has just uh, finished uh, writing a book on poetry. And uh, the tragedy, of course, for her was that while she was arrested, while she was in Mountjoy, um, Maud Gahn's house was raided and she'd been living with Maud Gahn and that book was uh, destroyed uh, and she had uh, no notes anywhere else. I suppose that was the time, obviously, before emailing your book to yourself. Uh, but this must have been absolutely a trauma um, for her when she was uh, in uh, prison to hear this. She had a BA in English Literature. She had been teaching English Literature in Alexandra before she was arrested. And in Tragedies of Kerry, she marshalled her literary skills um, as she described uh, the beauty of the Kerry landscape, the anti-materialism of the people, uh, and certainly by contrast with, as she sees it, the kind of bourgeois uh, ugliness of the free state and the nobility of Kerry Republicans. Creating such a synergy, in turn, underscored the brutality of um, the uh, National Army, uh, particularly the Dublin Guard, uh, and uh, the rapaciousness of uh, the, the soldiers under the command of Paddy O'Daly. But there were no similar haunting descriptions of the Knocknagoshal murders in Tragedies of Kerry, despite the fact that, as the Cork examiner wrote, quote, portions of the mangled bodies were found hundreds of yards away, end quote. O'Connor himself uh, was decapitated in the landmine attack. His head, his decapitated head, discovered by a young girl, Bridie Lyons. The reality of what must have been Bridie Lyons' distress was not mentioned at all by McArdle. In tragedies of Kerry, O'Connor and three other men were killed. The total death toll was in reality five, the highest daily number sustained by the National Army in six months. Another man, Joseph O'Brien, sustained severe injuries. Although he would survive after both his legs were amputated, the Cork Examiner on the 8th of March reported that he was, quote, in a dying condition. McArdle's Republican perspective is also evident at the language of, of, of uh, sorry, it, McArdle's uh, Republican perspective is evident also at the level of language. The men who were lured to the Nocknagoshal men mine on the 6th of March on the pretense of an anonymous, anonymous letter uh, giving details of a hidden IRA arms dump were just killed. Uh, that's a somewhat neutral term. The men at Ballysidi, Killarney and Carsevine were slaughtered and massacred. So if you deconstruct it down to that level, you can see uh, at the level of language her Republican perspective. Throughout the text, National Army soldiers are described as hunting Republicans. Uh, almost, uh, you know, they are, they are the prey of the, the National Army. Outlining the death of Michael O'Sullivan of Knock Anne's uh, North Kerry, McArdle wrote that the free state soldiers, quote, fell on him in a fury. Uh, and there's no similar description about uh, attacks on uh, um, free state soldiers by Republicans. On the 11th of March, during the transfer of prisoners from Carsevine to Killarney, Michael Tiny Lyons, having killed Frank Grady, was, according to McArdle, quote, pushing his gun into the faces of the other prisoners and seemed eager to kill more. So she suggests a sort of gratuitous violence uh, amongst uh, the National Army in Kerry. By contrast, McCardle claimed that, quote, to kill or ill-use a prisoner in any way was impossible for Republicans. She said that having no recourse to buildings to house captors in, in Kerry, they had, quote, no alternative but to disarm the men and set them free to hunt their captors again. So she represents them as having a, certain, a sort of nobility that was absolutely devoid uh, amongst uh, the uh, National Army. Liam Lynch, of course, had uh, issued an order on the 22nd of September prohibiting summary executions of prisoners uh, by the IRA, and that order, um, you know, McCardle argues, stood up. Um, eschewing a statistical approach to the Civil War Republican dead in Kerry in favour of naming uh, the murder victims and connecting them to their families and to their locality, McArdle asks her reader to identify on a human level with those whose lives were shortened or changed for the worse uh, by pro-treaty forces. The reader hears of John Kevins of Beaufort, Tom O'Sullivan of Ballynaig and Jack Fleming of Tralee. These were all men uh, that had that inner nobility that McCardle used as a signifier of Republican activists. 
They could, she wrote, quote, have saved themselves if they chose to surrender to their torturers, to betray their comrades or desert their cause. By contrast with the depravity of the National Army, the violence of the Republican male was mitigated in her construction by the righteousness of fighting for the ideal of the Republic. Republican violence in her construction was a violence that was stripped of brutality and mindlessness. Not Nagashal then in Tragedies of Kerry was the result of the brutality of, Pat's, uh, of Paddy Pats O'Connor and not the men, and indeed by association the two uh, common Amman women, uh, Mary discussed Kathleen Walsh earlier, who lured the eight uh, members of the National Army to the landmine. McCardle wrote of the way acceptance of the treaty and the establishment of the provisional government uh, and later the free state government had allowed the values of the republic fought for during the war of independence and encapsulated in the noble republican male to give way to an altogether less edifying society and a policy that was that facilitated uh, the brutalities she documented in tragedies of Kerry. during the siege at Cl clash malcolm caves she wrote how the beam of the National Army searchlight made the creek below look like, quote, the pit of hell, end quote. She wrote how rage and fury grew in the defeated horde, and that's a really interesting word, I think, horde of Irish Free State soldiers above the cliff. The din, she wrote, was fiendish. In her Civil War jail journal, and McCardle kept a really interesting jail journal, uh, I think it's probably only a portion uh, that remains because it, it uh, ends, it's in the Devil Era papers in UCD and it, it ends kind of just suddenly in March, early March 1923. Uh, uh, but in this Civil War jail journal, she wrote of uh, what she saw as this new ignoble society that resulted from acceptance of the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. And this is what she wrote. It seemed as if the people of Ireland had lost that living spiritual sense which revolts against cruelty and responds to suffering and is inspired by courage and courageous moods. And in the leaders who have inducted the change in the people, it is as if all the spiritual force had turned to malice and hideousness and would never uh, give way to justice or mercy again. In Tragedies of Kerry, McCardle asserted that the men who took what she described as the shameful oath were, quote, vile and guilty men, quote, bestial and so grossly insane. Ireland's freedom, she wrote, quote, is a thing of spiritual life or death that there is no evading. Purified by spendthrift sacrifice, it makes heroes denied and stifles, it makes treacherous men. So, the men of the uh, Western Division, the men of the Dublin Guard, were, according to her analysis, according to her construction, were treacherous men, violent gu uh, guilty men, bestial and grossly insane men. Conducting interviews with Republicans from the late 1930s, Ernie O'Malley believed that the men would talk to him in an honest manner. These interviews were published under the title, The Men Will Talk To Me. Tragedies of Kerry might actually be subtitled, The Women Will Talk to Me. Much of the violence against Republican soldiers in Kerry is described from the point of view of female family members with a focus on mothers. McCardle referred to ascertaining, quote, clear facts through the intimate, as she put it, questioning of witnesses. Many of those intimate interviews were conducted with women when she went to Kerry in uh, spring of 1924. Kerry, she wrote, was a county used to resistance to foreign invasion and foreign rule. Young men will fight, but, quote, old women, oh, sorry, but young men will fight, but, quote, old men and old women and young girls will be taking their share. And taking their share in tragedies of Kerry uh, for women meant uh, watching uh, um, and worrying about their uh, male loved ones when they were imprisoned uh, and then grieving uh, when uh, and if they were killed by uh, Free State uh, Army members. <clears throat> Throughout tragedies of Kerry, McCardle emphasised the youth of the Republican soldiers she described in a bid to underscore the depravity of the National Army. 
John Lawler of Valley Haig had, quote, only a few years of manhood. Michael Sinnott and James O'Connor were 18 and 19 years old, respectively. Highlighting the youth of the Republican dead called attention to their connections to their families to the fact that a significant number were still living in their family home. <clears throat> Beginning tragedies of Kerry, uh, uh, in North Kerry, McCardle recounted the murder of Republican Bertie Murphy, a 17-year-old killed in September 1922. Eluding the Free State Army for four months after the outbreak of the Civil War, Bertie Murphy was finally captured and threatened with being shot, quote, at his mother's door. In McArdle's account, his mother stood at the door of her shop in Castle Island and watched, literally watched from the door of her shop as her son was led slowly up the street. Uh, he was, she, McArdle wrote, quote, pale and disfigured, his face bruised. So she's watching from her shop, according to the construction, as she sees her damaged son, her bruised, her battered son being led away to she does not know what. The text details <coughs> the trepidation and fear of his mother as she heard rumours about how the Free State soldiers intended to remove potentially mined barricades using Republican prisoners. So many of the incident McArdle recounts in the text highlight the way the Irish Free State soldiers transgressed the norms of a civilised society, a signifier of which, for McArdle, was the overturning of the female space of the home and violence in the presence of women. In fact, uh, when she talked about, in another text, the capture of er Erskine Children's, she argues that Erskine Children's could have saved himself, he could have escaped, but he wouldn't draw his gun because there were women present. Uh, so the Free State soldiers in Tragedies of Kerry are very different uh, to somebody like Children's because they are willing to use violence in the presence of women. Eugene Fitzgerald's mother's home, we're told, was raided again and again. The home of his aunt, Mrs. O'Connell, was known to the National Army soldiers who sheltered there during the War of Independence. McArdle recounted an incident in which the men, as she put it, now doing the black and tan work, broke into Mrs. O'Connell's home, drunk and inured to any pleas um, <coughs> from the women uh, within any, any kind of response to the fact that they were screaming in fear. Repeatedly, McArdle referred to the violence carried out by, as she put it, quote, drink-sodden, irresponsible men. And of course, drunken soldiers were particularly frightening to women in the context of war because of the fear of sexual assault. <clears throat> During the raid on Mrs. O'Connell's home, Eugene Fitzgerald was taken to Trilly Jail. And his mother, I mean, I think it's really interesting the way she puts the reader into the mind of his mother. His mother spent five full days outside the gate of the jail, outside the gate of Tralee Jail, pleading and begging to be allowed to see her son. She sent notes to Paddy O'Daly, but as we've heard from Mary's paper earlier, Paddy O'Daly really had no interest in, um, you know, placating women, um, even if they weren't uh, combatants. Uh, finally, uh, Eugene Fitzgerald's mother was told she would be shot if she did not shut her mouth, and that's, that's a quote. She was only allowed entry into Tralee Jail once uh, her son, Eugene Fitzgerald, had been tortured and killed. That's when she gained entry. The final words in the account of Eugene Fitzgerald's death are given by McArdle to his mother. They opened the gate then and let her go to her son. He was dead at this point. Uh, he had nothing to tell me and nothing to say to me. They didn't begrudge letting me in then. So the torture is also a torture of his mother. He's tortured within the jail, and she's being arguably tortured outside the jail, albeit in a different way. Similarly, John Kevin's mother, uh, on hearing that he had been shot uh, in a shop at Car Caron 
a home outside Beaufort on the 15th of May, went immediately uh, and begged Michael Bishop, first of all, to be allowed to send for an ambulance um, at her own expense, and then when that permission was not forthcoming, she begged and pleaded to be allowed to see him, to be allowed in to see him, uh, into where he was being held captors. But the soldiers, quote, were ordered to push her out of the road, so violence against women. McCardle emphasised, um, again, kind of showing the nobility of the Republican soldier vis-a-vis -vis the brutality and depravity of the free state um, and suggesting that the free state did not understand or wouldn't adhere to the rules of war. So McCardle, in this account of John Kevin's death, she uh, noted that uh, the previous November, in November 1922, he had secured the transfer of James Dempsey to Dublin when he, uh, Dempsey, an officer in the National Guard, was wounded during an attack on Republican Republicans in the McKillicuddy Reeks. <clears throat> but there's no similar uh, kind of um, uh, willingness to uh, engage with any decency um, to John Kevin's mother uh, when he was being held captive and when he ultimately was killed. Sinnott and O'Connor were killed in the hayshed attached to the home of Mrs. Lyons in Tralee. On the night of their murders, she was awakened by shots outside. This is Mrs. Lyons. And this is how McCardle describes the incidents. Soldiers were in the kitchen. They would not let her daughter go out. She tried to light a candle, but her hands were shaking. And you can, I think, sense the fear, the fear for herself, and of course the fear for her daughter as well. Her daughter struck a match and lit the candle and looked at her. The girl was trembling too, and her face was white. Mrs. Lyons went out to the dugout, and she saw both men, Sinnott and O'Connor, quote, riddled with bullets dead. Bob McCarthy of Monoree was sitting in the house of a friend on the 24th of March with a child on both knees when soldiers rushed in and struck him on the head with a revolver. This is according to McCardle. His sister pleaded at the gate of Dingle Workhouse where he was incarcerated. So a very similar uh, kind of occurrence, or she's, McCardle is presenting a very similar trope, the imprisoned man, the uh, female member of the family pleading outside the space where he was incarcerated. So uh, Bob McCarthy's sister pleaded at the gate of Dingle Workhouse where he was incarcerated, pleaded to be allowed to enter. And when she was finally allowed in, uh, her brother, she saw him uh, bloody and bruised and being goaded by the soldiers on duty. Her bruised, bloody brother was being forced to play a game of football uh, um, by the uh, National Army soldiers. McArdle's description of a violence that involved ransacking and desecrating the domestic space and forcing women to bear witness to violence and the death of men within their family unit was constructed as a form of assault, psychological, if not always physical. The trope of the woman as witness to the violence and brutality of the Irish Free State soldiers runs through this book, Tragedies of Kerry, even in the inclusion of certain photographs that focus on the maternal loss or focus on the domestic space of the home. Through the photographs, the reader is, for example, brought into the kitchen of Dan Shea's family home, a room with, as you can see, very basic furniture and an open fire. Shea's mother, father, and two young sisters stare out of the photograph so the reader is, is, is kind of brought into that family space. His mother, father, and two young sisters stare out of the photograph, forcing the reader to contemplate uh, the way whole families were affected by the violence against Republicans in County Kerry, and of course, elsewhere. Uh, but this, of course, is a, a partisan text, so there's no similar uh, discussion about how families of the Free State dead also suffered. Uh, Dan Shea was a labourer and he was, his, his labouring wages was very important to that family uh, and um, you can see this is very much a posed photograph. Um, it's uh, very much um, a uh, suggests, you know, the fact that people did talk to McCardle and she was able to get these photographs to include in uh, Tragedies of Kerry. McCardle recounts the capture of Ty Coffey and Jeremiah Donoghue on the 22nd of February 1923 in the context of the Countess Bridge Massacre. Um, okay. <coughs> and this is what she, uh, uh, how she describes it. Um, 
When the troops uh, rushed into the house, Donoghue was uh, resting at the fire and Coffey was cleaning his gun. Wilson, who was in command, rushed at Coffey, shouting abuse and began to kick and beat him violently. His mother screamed and Wilson struck her a blow that flung her across the floor. The soldiers rushed uh, about the cottage, smashing the cock crockery and the dresser, dresser, smashing the pictures in the room, spilling the milk and flour all over the floor. And McArdle's focus on ordinary kitchen items and comestibles accentuates arguably the violation of the domestic sphere. And it is really noteworthy, I think, that McArdle does not include a photograph of any of the men killed at Countess Bridge, like uh, Stephen Buckley here. She doesn't include that photograph. Instead, she offers this image. This is uh, Stephen Buckley's mother. And again, it's very much a staged photograph. You know, she's not looking straight at the camera, maybe she did not want to, but it's very much a staged photograph. And I think uh, the inference is, of course, that she spoke to McArdle. The women would speak to her. So this leaves the reader with the sense that the violence against Republicans was a violence that permeated the entire uh, um, family network of those who were killed. She also, for example, included this picture of Errol Lyons' mother. Errol Lyons, of course, was killed during the siege of the Clash Malkin uh, caves. And again, what you're seeing, uh, you know, are very basic houses um, and uh, being brought into these uh, spaces, these domestic spaces, the reader being brought into these domestic spaces where women uh, experienced trauma and loss uh, in the context of the civil war in Kerry. McArdle put a similar focus on the impact on women when she discusses the murder of Patrick Lynch of Moirisk, West Kerry. She notes that his wife was a captain of Common Amman in the area and his wife refused, McArdle wrote, to exhibit fear when National Army soldiers jeered that they would put him in a coffin when they located him. So Lynch was on the run and uh, uh, his wife was uh, you know, being harassed uh, as to where he was and uh, she was being jeered at and she was being threatened that uh, her husband would be killed when the Free State soldiers uh, located him as they promised her they would. Now, Lynch returned home on the 30th of November 1922 and we're told he returned home to plough his field, having no one to do the work of his small farm. Again, McCardle is placing the emphasis on the ordinary, the domestic and the mundane to uh, emphasise or to highlight the brutality of uh, the uh, Free State uh, soldiers. And she painted the following family scene. So he does his work on the farm, he ploughs his field, and he was tired uh, after it, and sat down about six o'clock to enjoy his tea. So end of a day, domestic space, and an hour's rest by the fire. His brother had come in, his wife was working at her sewing machine. His sister was rocking the cradle, the baby Nancy was one year old. So presenting a type of uh, simple uh, domestic bliss. And she says, this quiet domestic scene uh, was sh abruptly shattered as National Army soldiers surrounded the home. Lynch exited the home and his wife heard shot after shot. And uh, often that was the way in which women uh, knew that their loved ones had been killed near the locality of the home. They heard shots. And running out, uh, Lynch's wife uh, found her husband's body with a bullet wound, quote, through it from side to side. And she is then presented with more violence. The soldiers shouted at her, one declaring, quote, get out of my way or I'll give you the contents of this, lifting his rifle. The soldiers then proceeded to carry Lynch's body back into the house. Again, McArdle emphasized the transgression of the domestic space, the domestic sphere. The soldiers flung Lynch's body on the ground. And his baby, Nancy, just one year old, we've been told, went to him and began shaking him, calling to Dada to wake up and she walking in his blood. While McArdle represented this invasion of the domestic sphere as a particular example of the heinousness that marked out the Free State soldier from his Republican counterpart, the reality was that her binary was deeply flawed. The book was, as I've been saying, of course, a propagandist polemic that would be regularly republished, making it difficult, as Anne Dolan states, to view the Free State soldier 
as engaged in, quote, anything other than grotesque mob violence. The reality was also, as Yuna Halpin discusses, that Republicans adopted the moral high ground, yet their interpretation of the recognised rules of war was, as O'Halpin states, highly eclectic. The spate of executions from November 1922 into January 1923 resulted in the IRA beginning a policy of attacks on Free State soldiers and supporters in their own homes. The TD James McGarry lost his son when his house was set on fire, when Kevin O'Higgins' father was shot during an arson attack on his home. These examples are just a few of a litany of such attacks by the IRA on domestic spaces in the period. Now, McArdle herself referred to the attack on McGarry's house and noted the death of his son, referring to it as awful news, but the core of her response was to fear that this incident would lead to further attacks on Republicans. I suppose Republican homes, she said, will be burnt and the children of Republicans hurt, end quote. The Free State used the argument <coughs> that the suffering endured by wives and mothers on the Republican side in Kerry was the fault of reckless leaders within the IRA who refused to accept, quote, the authority of the people. O'Daly, Paddy O'Daly, who gave evidence at the inquest on Bertie Murphy's death, made this point. He stated that uh, Bertie Murphy was one of 30 IRA men who, quote, ran into a deadly ambush quote, on their way into Killarney. He sympathised with Murphy's mother on the death of her son, but he continued, he continued, uh, and he said this, I cannot help thinking, and I cannot help reminding others that there are, in addition to your son lying also dead here, slain by their countrymen, two young Irish soldiers. He didn't have very good syntax. And like you there uh, are three uh, women, two uh, mothers and a wife, and little do they know that the mortal remains of those so dear to them are on their way back to their family graveyards as a result of the blind and foolish confidence in leaders. It is the women and children that are suffering, and for all the suffering that is being endured, those leaders are to blame. McArdle failed to acknowledge the viewpoint of such people, such as O'Daly, that the IRA were culpable in not accepting what O'Daly described as the authority of the people. The power of the free state was not, McArdle declared, quote, founded on the will of the people. It was, quote, English tyranny in a green coat. And the free state soldiers who fought to defend it during the Civil War were, she said, agents of empire. Now, O'Daly, of course, uh, as Mary discussed earlier, was implicated in the assault of Flossie and Jesse McCarthy uh, in Kinmair on the 2nd of uh, June 1923. I, th I think implicated is probably the wrong word. He was involved in the assault uh, of Flossie and Jesse McCarthy in Khmer on the 2nd of June 1923. His revolver was found at the scene. Both young women, as Mary discussed earlier, were taken by gunpoint from their beds and subjected to fl uh, flogging and hair greasing. And as Mary discussed, their hair fell out as a result of that hair greasing. There was also allegations of sexual assault, but as Mary discussed earlier, uh, Bill Bailey did state that uh, O'Daly, uh, Edward Flood and uh, Jim Clark uh, uh, stated that they raped the two women. Now, McArdle does not mention uh, the two women. He, she does not mention uh, Flossie and Jessie McCarthy in uh, Tragedies of Kerry. As she firmly stated to Frank Aiken, Tragedies of Kerry had a tight propagandist focus the death of Republican soldiers on the roadsides of Kerry. The book, however, was, I would suggest, also heavily focused on the suffering of the female family members of those men. This focus of tragedies of Kerry, McCarley did not state to Frank Aiken, maybe because it would have been too radical for him to hear in 1924. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leanne, and, and what a deep dive tour de force into the tragedies of Kerry, a book that would be very familiar to very many in the audience here, but interestingly to take that, that focus that this is Dorothy talking to the women, the, the families of, of those who had been killed in Kerry. Um, and I will throw the open to the audience. I, there's a li um, the light is in my face, so put your hand up high and a mic will come to you. Can I see any hands up? Oh, over here. Through here. 
just to compliment Leanne. Um, De Valera, of course, in Doherty's book, The Irish Republic, he endorsed Doherty as the true authentic author, a knowledgeable one of the Republic. And I think as a compliment to you, your presentation was like prose when you were reading out Dorothy's. And I'm sure De Valera would be delighted to be listening to it today. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, my question really is down to the photographs, because I was fascinated with the photographs that are in the book. And the current editions don't have the photographs for some, whether it's the economy or otherwise. Uh, but the one of Aero Lines' mother, she built a great story about the clock chiming for no particular reason when the event was happening in Clash Milken. She brought that little bit of superstition, etc., into it. So that's the first question, uh, what do you think of that? And the second one, is there a, not a need for the publishing houses maybe to start cutting down on the big volumes of books and writing, because it proved to be a very popular, booklets are still a very popular thing, even though they're only stapled together, they're handy, they can be stuck in the pocket, <laughs> and everything else like that. Thank you very much. Um, I think that um, Dorothy did Dorothy was a literary person and uh, she, she very much used that kind of idea of prefiguring of events in a lot of her literary work. So uh, the books she published or wrote while she was in uh, Mountjoy and Kilmaine, in which we published as seven stories of, uh, of the, the Civil War um, Earthbound, there's a lot of that kind of prefiguring. So that's Dorothy rather than Errol Lines' mother, I would suggest. Um, it's also in that um, got her first gothic novel, uh, the uh, the unforeseen or the uninvited. So that's that's Dorothy's kind of interest in kind of prefiguring as a kind of literary device. Uh, as for the uh, republishing of um, uh, small pamphlets, again, I think maybe as as Gemma Clark said earlier about uh, you know uh, with about the Atlas of the Irish Revolution, maybe. To speak to the publishers. Well, UCD Press have a really good series, Life and Times, which are, and one of our speakers, uh, Dahi, has a Cahal Brua in that, I think, yeah. Um, um, Life and Times series, which is a small book, fit in your pocket. <laughs> uh, over here again. Yeah, there's, there's just two, two questions. Um, one is, like, there seems to be an argument that there's an equivalence of, of, um, of violence, but if you look at it, on the one hand, you had the state, which they, the, the, the free state arguing they were legi the legitimate state of the country, defending democracy on the higher moral ground, the defenders of law and order. And they would see the IRA basically as terrorists. So like, if they are the defenders of law and order and on the high moral ground defending democracy, then they're not setting a very good example. I mean, that's, that's the first sort of point I would make. Um, the second point, uh, uh, well, the second question really is, what kind of vision did Dorothy McArdle have for the Republic? I mean, what kind of a Republic did she want to see come into existence, or did she give any thought to it? Um, well, I, I take your point about the fact that uh, the Irish Free State were supposed to be upholding law and order, but you could also then argue maybe that uh, the, uh, a majority uh, decision had been taken, you know, on the Anglo-Irish Treaty in the Dáil, and then when it went to the people, so... Um, you know, Dorothy would certainly agree with your point. Um, uh, Dorothy did talk about uh, uh, what kind of a, a republic that she believed. Uh, she certainly felt uh, the type of republic she believed in. She certainly felt that um, it uh, should not be won at all costs. So she did actually, in, in different kind of uh, texts, like in her jail journal, uh, negotiate, you know, uh, what violence should be used for and what end. Uh, it should be used for. I think she would have very much have been, um, um, once De Valera came to power with Fianna Fáil, would have accepted his kind of uh, idea of uh, using, uh, dismantling the treaty through uh, parliamentary politics. Uh, she, she was somebody who did believe, despite her privileged position in, uh, you know, equality, class equality, and um, 
you know, was concerned with, with you know, issues around poverty and hardship in, uh, in the Irish Free State. She wrote um, in the Irish press quite a number of articles about uh, the way in which, again, women experienced the uh, kind of levels of poverty, very high levels of poverty. For a while, she hoped that De Valera, when he came into power in 1932, uh, would, you know, deal with that. He didn't, obviously. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, we've, we've two in the middle here and one over here. So we take these two in the middle first. Thank you very much. That was a, a lovely presentation and um, really visceral in its uh, connecting with the multifaceted nature of the violence that happened during the Civil War. I have a question directly in relation to the reconciliation of that violence, which is, as we're seeing currently in, in present day, the violence against women, particularly the threat or the reality of sexual violence, compounds, because of its nature, the general unspeakability of it, which makes it very hard to reconcile or to bring into the, the stream of movement. Because you know, when trauma, tragedy, and violence happens to people in the micro or the macrocosm, parts of them get stuck. And so my question is, and it's not a question that necessarily needs a comprehensive answer, but it's something I'm wondering, which is how can we, or how is it best to go about creating syntax to have discussions about unspeakable violence, particularly violence that happens as, as because of a collapse in social form and social construct, so that it can be reconciled, particularly when it happens to, as you say, you know, with women, it's the center of the whole world. I mean, you know, the, the whole nature of the, of the social that's so if you could. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, being succinct is not my strength. Does that make sense? Is that a clear question? Or am I being... Well, I think, you I know, just pass it back. I think, um, you know, colleagues of mine like Mary um, are, are working on this. You know, they're, they're mining the archives. They're, they're going to the actual primary sources and, uh, you know, examining what hasn't been spoken about before and bringing it into the, into the historical debate. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, just a quick one. Um, when early on Mali went around, he left behind voluminous uh, notebooks. They may be hard to read, but they're his contemporaneous notes of the interviews he was having. Did McArdle do that? Is, are, are they similar or, or not? Yeah, that's a great question, but McArdle actually suffered quite a number of burnings in her life, uh, you know, going back to actually Gemma's paper about arson. So uh, she suffered, I, I really feel for her, you know, I think anyone who's try to publish a book and then it gets burnt literally before it gets to the publishing press uh, would feel for her. Um, so she had that burning that I explained about, you know, her book of poetry it was burned by the Free State soldiers. Then on her death, her brother burned all her papers. So actually the problem with um, trying to reconstruct or to recreate Dorothy's life is the fact that you're left with, you know, no kind of voluminous body of sources. And she did write, she was a writer, she kept um, a huge amount of information. So yes, I would imagine there were notebooks, but they were lost. The jail journal I referred to, somehow some of it escaped the burning and ended up in the Devil Era papers. So, you know, yes, I, I think there was, but there isn't now is the, is the answer to that. Um, Helen, over here, and that'll be the last question. Yeah, it's just a very quick one, um, Leanne. Do you, and it probably it's answered by the burning, but do you have any idea who took the photographs of the book? Did she? I don't know. I wish I did. Yeah, um, and I think it's really interesting that that man said they're not in the. I haven't got a copy of the new book, or the new publication. Um, uh, I don't know who took them. No, there's no notes on the Emerson Press volume as to who took them. Would, and again, could, you see, would I she imagine, have had a camera herself? I, I don't know. And again, that would be probably in you know in her papers. But we we that's it's just the absolute horrendousness of burning somebody's. Papers. And a very quick question behind you there, Helen. Yes, it, I'm just thinking <clears throat> about all of that we've heard, and there was a phrase that came to me this morning, and it was about 
settling the scores. And I'm going to take that away with me because I think that there is another whole kind of conference or whatever, 10 years time about the next stage on. What happened to all of that violence and everything else that was done to people and families and everything over those years? And it didn't all just go away with the, mm. with the, 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 the way forward. And I, I, I'm left with that, but thank you indeed. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, you can see that in the pension files, you can see the, the sense of, you know, unresolved violence and, you know, a lot of the, the you know, the, the, big, the family members of uh, the, the Republican family members didn't get compensation because the uh, Free State claimed that they were setting mines in the first place. So, you know, that, that violence wasn't resolved, you know, um, just in 1923 when the Civil yeah. War ended. Well, uh, we, have, we are taking a quick comfort break now, and I'll just take advantage of my position of chair to say, I think Leanne has shown us, rather than dismissing tragedies of Kerry, as some do, as, as a polemic, uh, and not worth, you know, uh, really the, the paper it's written on in some ways, or the absolute truth of Kerry uh, in that period. What you do, what you did is mine down into it and look at the voices that are coming through. And of course, seeing how Dorothy is putting her spin on it, her literary spin and her Republican spin, but it's still a very valuable resource and a source uh, used, as Leanne has done, uh, with, with, with great care. Um, and uh, to read that Tragedies of Kerry is something that, that does represent a certain type of reading of what happened in Kerry at that time. So I'd like to thank our speaker, Dr. Leanne Lane, our keynote speaker. Thank you very much.